blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit be with us today. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe you've heard the story about the pastor who was having a lot of difficulty with his assigned parking space on the church parking lot. Seems that his parishioners parked in this spot whenever they pleased. Even though there was this sign that clearly read, This space reserved. Well, he thought the sign needed to be a little bit clearer. So he had a different sign made, which read, Reserved for a pastor only. And still, people in the church ignored it and parked in his space whenever they felt like it. Maybe the sign needs to be a little bit more forceful, he thought. So he devised a more intimidating sign, which announced, Thou shalt not park here. <laughs> well, that sign didn't make any difference either. And finally, he hit upon the words that were, in fact, nobody ever took his parking space again, for this sign read, The one who parks here preaches the sermon on Sunday morning. <laughs> And I tell you this little story because most of you would probably hedge at the prospect of such a ministry, namely preaching the sermon on a Sunday morning, although there's one person out there who could do that. You would probably feel uncomfortable about doing that, probably because of a lack of experience on your part, but probably more so a lack of training. But you still have a ministry. What is your ministry? Well, you know there's a variety of ministries which all of the people of the church can be involved. And these ministries are based basically upon a list of various gifts we have that St. Paul made one time in the New Testament when he talked about church people being involved in preaching and teaching and, and administration and, and caretaking and praying, even arbitrating. Well, our gospel reading for this weekend, as well as those other two texts that have been selected for this uh, Sunday, set before us a vision of a common ministry that all of us can be a part of. And if you looked at the title of the message today, that's why I would call something like a ministry of hospitality. Uh, let's begin by looking at that concept of hospitality. And again, all three... Bible readings remind us not to set ourselves above other people. When we are together as the people of God, we ought to give place to one another. We ought to be hospitable. And the reading from Proverbs, our Old Testament lesson, says, Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. In the epistle, the writer of the Hebrews encourages us, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Now, if we look at our gospel reading for the day, it takes us to the parable about the wedding feast. And Jesus warns the guests that if you immediately claim a place of honor at such a gathering, you had better be prepared to experience some embarrassment when a more honored guest than you is ushered to your seat and you are forced to take one of those undesirable spaces in the back of the hall. And then Jesus concludes by saying that if you want to be truly hospitable when you give a luncheon or a dinner, you ought not to invite the same old friends all the time, but rather people who could never repay you like the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Jesus, I think, is beginning to build a case here for a very important truth, that there are no throwaways when it comes to being human beings. Everybody is worthy of your attention and your greeting. There is no one who doesn't deserve your kindness, your hospitality, or mine. In fact, Jesus suggests that you're taking a real chance when you slight certain people. They might turn out to be angels 
you did not even know about. Now on the surface, as we look at our gospel, this appears to be a story about good social manners at a wedding. But its deeper purpose is to remind you and me and the family of God about our calling to be genuinely hospitable to one another. In the background looms that even brighter message about God's hospitality to each and every one of us sinners that we are. It's a hospitality that God showed us in the ministry of his own blessed Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask the question, well, what is this ministry of hospitality? To help us, let's look more closely at the word hospitality, but before we look at its literal meaning, I need to point out that there's a difference between hospitality and simply entertaining. Someone has written these words, I think very good words. Hospitality must not be confused with entertaining. Entertaining says, come to my house, admire my possessions, see the beautiful way the table is set, enjoy the scrumptious food that has taken me all week to prepare, see how perfectly neat and tidy and clean my house is, come and listen to my views and thoughts. Entertaining is hard, stressful, because through it, we perpetuate the myth that we are perfect. We put up a facade saying we manage our lives perfectly. Our children are perfectly disciplined and obedient. Hospitality is totally different. We do not seek to portray a perfect image. People can love us in our weakness, relax with us, and enjoy our company. An even deeper meaning of the word hospitality emerges when we realize that this word comes from the same source as two similar sounding words. The first is the word hospice, and the other is the word hospital. The word hospice means shelter, and the word hospital means a place of healing. In this light, we can examine some of our own words and actions toward other people. Do my words, my actions, provide a shelter for other people when they are around me? Do my words and my deeds promote a sense of healing for other people when they are around me? How hospitable am I, really? Now, for a moment, let's push that word hospice to its limits. We are aware that today the word hospice usually refers to a special kind of care or a place meant for people who are dying. People with terminal illnesses receive hospice care. In the church, we need to remember as we deal with one another, with fellow church members, with visitors, with other folks in our communities, that there may be among us people who are dying. They're dying on the inside. For whatever reason, life is currently treating them harshly and they feel broken. Some are dying just to know someone. They have few, if any, friends. Some are dying to feel connected. They don't feel like they even belong to the human race anymore. Some are dying to be affirmed. They are weary from feeling that they amount to nothing. Some are dying to be touched, even if only by eye contact, or by some word of acknowledgement from another human being. All these people need hospice care. They need the hospitality of the church because inwardly, inwardly they're dying. They need a place of shelter, no matter how fleeting, where they can catch another fresh breath of air to sustain them lest they die. There was a minister who had a favorite slogan that he often repeated in his sermons. He said, the church is not a country club. It's a hospital. 
And I think that's what Jesus is saying here also when he gave us the direction. Do not invite your friends or your rich neighbors. Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You and I are not in the church to impress each other or to win power struggles. We are here to minister to one another, yes, even in all of our weaknesses. We are here to be hospitable. Now, nobody can tell you specifically what your ministry of hospitality must be. We should never overdefine such a highly personal ministry. But we must, each of us, define that ministry for ourselves. To encourage us about this, let's look at the ministry of Jesus. In a way, we could call Christ's ministry to you and to me a ministry of hospitality. Yes. That is what he showed us. And the Apostle Paul stated it in his epistle, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think of that. Yet sinners. God the Heavenly Father did not withhold hospitality from us until we straightened ourselves out. While we were yet sinners. Christ was hospitable toward us by going to the cross and dying for us in our place. Noticing our sin, Christ did not refuse to notice us. He did not stop talking to us. He did not withhold information from us about God's love. No, in Christ, God made eye contact with us. The Word became flesh. The face of God now faces us. Looking into that face, we feel sheltered and healed. Looking at his cross, we know we are healed. We are cleansed and forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ. The cross enables us to follow that divine model of hospitality. And again, the Apostle Paul encourages us us toward Christ-like uh, uh, hospitality when he writes to the Christians in Philippi, let this mind be in you, that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and took on the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. In this great passage, Paul reminds us how Jesus fulfilled that parable we're considering in this gospel reading today. And to borrow a line from last Sunday's Gospel, Christ, who is the first, became the last, so that we, the last, might be first. Having all of our sins away, washed away by His obedience on the cross. So now, empowered by the cross of Christ, each and every one of us have our own ministry of hospitality. And this ministry is more than just showing good manners in public. It's a redemptive ministry like Christ, whereby we bring a sense of healing and genuine acceptance of all other people. It probably goes without saying that this ministry of hospitality needs to grow here, yes, even in Zion Lutheran Church. Smiling, saying hello, offering to help someone with a need can be important first steps but out of this initial hospitality, shown one another in the church narthex, needs to blossom into a deeper hospitality, whereby people come to know that God loves them and that he cares for them. In this regard, Christian hospitality always finally needs to involve some word of witness of the love of God in Christ. That's another way of saying hospitality, Christian hospitality, always involves evangelism. Speaking God's word of love to another human soul. What could be more hospitable? How could we provide more of a sheltering spirit or speak a more healing word than to remind someone of the love of God in the cross of Jesus Christ? 
with this message on the lips of its members. The church does indeed rise above any country club status and reveals itself as the glorious household of faith. There is an old mission hymn that has these words. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say, he died for all. May God bless your ministry, your ministry of hospitality. Amen. Having heard the word of our God, let us now go to God's altar with the prayers of the congregation. Please stand.